The scripture of the day comes from Mark 2, 1 through 12, from the NLT version. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or, Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And then the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. This is the word of the Lord. Well, happy Sunday, Echo Church. It's good to worship in the house of the Lord. Praise is amazing. And then when the ladies just break out in, I don't know, like a million part harmony, then you're just like, oh, yes, the spirit is here. So thank you, praise team. Thank you, praise team, for using your body and your vocal cords to help us to experience the presence of God in this place. It was so wonderful, like didn't want it to end. So when Sherry was like, another time, I'm like, yes, more. It's just so good to worship Jesus together. Um, my name is Joanne Moon. It's like, who's that lady? Yes, my name is Joanne Moon. We haven't seen each other's faces in a while. I'm an intern pastor here at Echo Church, and it's my joy and my honor to share the word of God with you. Today is Halloween, so is it okay to say? I don't know, we have mixed backgrounds, but I'm going to say it. Happy Halloween! Some people are like, I'm leaving now. This is an unholy church. Today, Echo Kids Ministry has prepared a really fun-filled time for our children to enjoy in the house of God. I saw some fantastic, like, not just like, you know, the half dress up because you have to, you know, the begrudging dress up, but I mean like the whole get up, the wigs down to your toes. Like, I've seen some wonderful... Um, outfits, costumes outside today. Um, and you know, I think really, I believe strongly in this fun in the house of God is so important. Because some of us didn't have fun in the house of God, am I right? And so we're all working that out right now. We want our children, remember when you were a kid, we want our children to attach to godly habits and godly community. We want all this experience of fun and joy to get into their little body so that as they grow up, it becomes strength for them. They remember and return to the house of the Lord in hard times. I mean, I'll give you an example. I'm a bona fide church lady. Um, I still remember fondly now when my parents used to wake me up at like 4.20 in the morning, me and my sister. And sometimes it'll be on Saturday. Sometimes it'll be midweek. Sometimes I'll have a whole week of, you know, early morning prayer services, and we would go. Um, and some of you may have experienced the New Year's Eve service for some of the immigrant Korean churches. All of a sudden, you go to church at 10 o'clock. Like, what? Dad is wearing a suit, and we go there. I think the premise is that, you know, we would end the year and begin the year in God's presence with God's people. Wonderful. So the past, you know, we spend time in worship, and the pastor starts preaching, and it's like 11.45, 11.52, 11.58, oh, he's still at point number one. Like, I don't think it's going to end. So we watch it hit 12 midnight, end at 12.18, and we kind of do this like deflated, five, four, yay, happy new year, right? And it's still joyous. It's still great. We all head out to Denny's, like stay there until 7 a.m. So some of you have fun memories like this. That's why you're back. That's why you're here. I mean, I remember some Saturdays 
um, being a part of the worship team. We were a smaller church. The bar was really low. So I was there all day, like practicing with the team. And then, you know, after the practice, you stay past midnight because I don't know why my parents let me, but if it was church, they let me. So, you know, you paint all the backdrops and you make like props for all the seasonal events, right? So, you know, all the laughter, the food, the joy of being part of something together, for me, has stayed after all these years. Do you guys know that old song? I always give you a song when I preach. And it's not planned, but you know, when it comes, I just grab it. So here it is, okay? If you know it, you know, nobody could hear you because you have a mask, so just kind of sing along, okay? It's a really old song. Sometimes Dr. Aaron messaged me after a sermon. He says, that was an old song. That was an oldie. Like, recognize, you know? We know it's like the same generation. So here it is. It goes like this. I love to live in your house, O oh Lord. I love to be here at your feet. And let your word be the food I eat. The food I eat. I love to live in your house, O oh Lord. To dine at the table with my king. And give to you the praise I bring. The praise I bring. And here in your house, I find your embrace. You set on my head a garland of grace. When I lift my hands, you fill me with more. I love to live, I love to live in the house of the Lord. Yay, you guys are all old. You guys know this song. So, you know, my hope is this. I hope my daughter, I hope I catch my daughter singing this song in the shower someday. And I think she's well on her way because when I tell her, tomorrow is church, I mean, tomorrow is Sunday, and then she'll say, on Sunday, we go to church. Yes. <laughs> and I ask, why do you like church so much? And she says, and I'm waiting for the answer, like, is it, is it this? Is it that? She goes, I, I like the playground and the snacks. <laughs> and I think, yes, it's working. Of all the playgrounds in all of Orange County, why this one? Of all, you know, all the goldfish and popcorn she's eating throughout the week in all kinds of places, why the one at church? It's working, it's happening. The love of gathering with people around Jesus is getting into our little body and becoming our big joy. So church, let's pray that our children grow up to confess that they too love to live in the house of the Lord, amen? And you know, really thank you, Echo Kid staff and parents. I know you've all had long weeks of this and that that we often just keep under wraps and we just kind of show up with brave faces. We just want to thank you for offering yourselves to bless our children. Your snacks rock, apparently. So let's church, let church be savory and sweet. Now, staying with the theme of Halloween, um, I have a question for you. What are the twin glories of Halloween? First, it's not a trick question. Candies? Maybe chocolate for some of you. I'm a chocolate person. And the second one? Yeah, dr costumes, dressing up. And if personally for me, if I had to pick which is the greater of the two of these glories of Halloween, I would pick dressing up. No? Thumbs up for agreement. Yeah, people are like, no, what are you talking about? It's only, I mean, this is my logic. You can always eat a candy or two or three, but it definitely draws more attention if you dress up and go to, the, go to work as an attorney or I don't know what you guys do. Um, if you go into the supermarket all dressed up just because, Halloween offers a nice reason to have a little fun, if you wish. Now, of all the costume options, the most classic but not classy, in my opinion, is the blood and gore, because I naturally kind of cower when I see things like that. But I think they win high marks because, you know, when do you ever get to dress up like that and not have to explain yourself or have somebody call the police and, like, take you away? It would freak people out, you know? And sometimes people choose to dress up as their alter ego. It's, like, personal. I had 
I know my husband's alter ego, but he told me not to tell you guys. So, you know, what, do you, yeah. Um, now, other people, you know, might have an excuse to dress sexy. I think that was really in when I was growing up. Like, everything's smaller, everything's like shorter, everything's tighter, you know? And other people like to show their creativity by putting something together themselves. I, I can't do that. So, you know, dressing up kind of shows even your belonging. Um, your pulse on culture, Squid Game, tracksuit 067. That's something, right? I didn't watch it, but I don't know that some people are dressing up like that. That seems to be the popular one this season. So, you know, dressing up is fun. But you know, the dressing up doesn't stop there. We've even dressed up Halloween, that word. That's why we use words like, I mean, it's not all the reason, but in part, we use words like harvest festival, like, no blood and gore, just the scarecrow, right? Um, we use holy ween. We use something palatable to cover and do away with whatever we personally think is bad about Halloween. You guys remember, if you're in youth group, you watch those um, documentaries about the satanic origins of Halloween and why you shouldn't go out to get free candy and, like, hang out with your friends in the neighborhood. You guys remember that? Well, so... With all that, let's get into Mark 2, because it's a, it's a really lively gospel as well. You're like, what? <laughs> you guys didn't want to hear the gospel of Mark? It's, it's such a lively um, gospel, really action-packed, so I want to invite you to it. So if you look at chapter 2, it's a really dynamic, fast-paced, dramatic, bustling passage about how the whole town has gathered around Jesus, and something kind of freaky happens. The story unfolds in this way. There's droves and droves and droves of visitors to see Jesus, who's recently inaugurated his ministry. What does Jesus do? He heals. He exorcises demons. That's like straight up Halloween stuff. And then he preaches with authority. And this all happens just under chapter one. So now at the beginning of chapter two, the news about Jesus has, I mean, traveled like wildfire. And so much so that Jesus' homestay, where he's staying right now, is packed out, and then some. It's a full house. So was Jesus, I'm looking at PM, is, was Jesus BTS of his time? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus definitely had a mixed crowd, right? He had a following, but, and, and there was lots of them, but not with the level of, you know, pure, unadulterated affection and adoration that I think BTS ARMY has for... BTS, right, PM? Like, people came out of curiosity as much as having a lot of personal needs that they needed to be met, they hoped to be met. Some people had a lot of excitement about potentially meeting Jesus, and some people had a lot of doubts, and they still showed up. People were carrying a range of level of interests and personal agendas as they gathered to see Jesus, and I think that's a little bit like us. I know you can't see it on the outside. Like, literally, you can't see it on the outside. Like, we're, like, covered up in one of the most important parts that show our expressions, you know? Even we can't make out what you're saying sometimes. So we can't tell on the outside and really know to our exactly alike in our motivation and hope for why we've come today. We're a mixed group of people. We have pains and joys and hopes and disappointments that we all carry in our bodies. But nonetheless, we are united because we have led with the body and we have showed up here to worship Jesus. So in Mark 2, you already know there's no COVID-19 back then. So I imagine, you know, it's a packed house. People are sitting shoulder to shoulder. I know none of your shoulders are touching for safety reasons, right? And I think, I imagine these people are like even cheek to cheek trying to push in and secure a better spot to get a glimpse of Jesus. And seriously, there's simply no more room, Scripture tells us, not even for one more person, not even outside the door. I don't know what that means, that there's no room outside, like there's not even walls. How do you even qualify for that? Now, onto this, onto this scene enters five people, four able-bodied and one disabled, looking for an opening to make their way to Jesus, but uh-uh-uh, it's not easy, virtually impossible. And if we say it like that, has a lot changed in our time today? You guys may have heard of Joni and Friends. It's 
It's like a nonprofit organization. This is what they say about themselves. Dedicated to reaching out to families living with disability all around the globe with gospel-adorned hope. They extend gospel-centered care through community support, respite, retreats, and getaways, and crisis response. And they connect families with Christ-honoring, disability-friendly churches where they find a place to belong. Sounds beautiful. I was um, combing through their website one day and I found an entry they wrote. It says, quote, but today, one of the largest unreached groups of people in the world have been artificially created by the church. Without anyone even realizing it, a huge number of people with disabilities have been locked or pushed out of the church. Multiple studies show that all things being equal, people with disabilities are less likely than their peers to attend church. There are about 2.25 million who, statistically speaking, should be attending church but don't. A 2018 study from Clemson University shows that children with any kind of disability are less likely than their peers to attend church, and children with autism are nearly twice as likely to never attend a religious service, end quote. Now, most of you know at least one family living with disability, but why one or two or so few? It's only a matter of time, I think, before we all get more and more acquainted with disability, whether by birth, accident, disease, or the aging process. Not Asian process, aging process. In today's story, there's five people, and these people face a tall and impenetrable wall, not made of bricks, but made of Jesus-seeking people. And these men have their work cut out for them. I mean, what takes other visitors, what, some push and shove to get their way um, in? These five men must work exponentially harder, risk more danger, take part in more messiness, for what? An uncertain outcome of even trying. But scripture tells us, up they go. How do you do it? People ask. You're amazing. I can never do what you do. The men on the roof might respond, I'm not superhuman. I do it because I must, because I care. And so they do, and somehow, they climb up to the top of the house, they bore, I don't know, bore a man-sized hole, if you could imagine that, hoist this disabled person securely and gently down right in front of Jesus. Talk about passion and precision. Talk about pressure and persistence. Is that how you see it? I imagine there's the house owner's perspective and the visitors who thought that they secure the best spot in the house perspective right in front of Jesus, so close I can touch him, and now, oh my gosh, like what a mess. Property damage, recklessness, interruption. Why are they so aggressive? So much nuisance. There's other people in the room, you know. I would not have done it like that. They better pay for this. This proves they shouldn't be here. They don't fit here. Was that Jesus' perspective? What did Jesus think? And best way to find that out is return to scripture Verse 5 says, seeing their faith. Jesus witnessed the four men in action, and he saw it and he said, that's faith. That they were motivated to action by faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says this, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So between the rubbles and the dust now beginning to settle, you can bet 
the four friends saw Jesus smiling at their sweaty faces. He saw the trouble they created, the mess they made, and saw their faith and understood everything through that lens. He saw them right where they were. And seeing the foreman's faith for the disabled man now lying before him, Jesus goes right into it, goes for it, right? In the same sentence that Jesus sees their faith, Jesus goes right for the what? The paralysis? No, actually no, right? Jesus doesn't go for his paralysis. Jesus doesn't heal his body. Instead, Jesus went for something different, deeper, I believe, at the core. Jesus says to him, lying there, paralyzed, says, your sins are forgiven. How did this man feel? What did this person think? We don't exactly know. What we do witness in that moment is this, that without negating this person's disability, we get to see him as someone who sins. Someone who has a propensity to sin, like all of humanity in need of a savior. Our greatest need, Jesus, our one thing. Jesus both forgives and humanizes him. And as to this man's sin itself, I mean, not much is said in this part of scripture. We're never preview to what kind of sin this man may have committed or that, or whether his sin has resulted in his disability. That's between this man and Jesus, and we can't say for sure. But before we could linger here long with some of our thoughts, now enters another group of people, Pharisees and religious leaders, onto the scene. They've actually been here all along, actually, you know, watching things that, as they unfold. Like, whoa, 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 right? And they've been there, they're watching everything, but they're not saying anything aloud. They're only grumbling and complaining privately in their hearts. They have questions, but their questions are a little bit bent out of shape. Not quite curiosity, not quite a thirst for knowledge, a pursuit of truth. Instead, their questions are more like accusations and fault finding. Well, it's pretty crazy in there, but Jesus doesn't miss any of it. Jesus knows what they are thinking. Jesus always knows what we're thinking. Others may miss it, what we're thinking. Others may feign ignorance, even though they know what we're thinking. They may wanna you know, avoid conflict and bad conversation because they think maybe it'll be uncomfortable and you'll be left with confusion or Ooh, they can't tolerate that much disagreement. But Jesus, Jesus is different. He doesn't shush it or shoo it away. Instead, he brings it out in plain sight. Hey, what are you grumbling about? You have questions? You have doubt? You wonder if I have authority to forgive sins. You're offended I might claim such authority and association with God with no evidence that you could believe in. Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or get up, pick up your mat and walk? Hey, bring all those questions to me. Bring all your doubts to me because you can't figure it out on your own. The answer lies with me. I am the answer. Let me show you, and boom, Jesus looks to the man forgiven, but still paralyzed up until then, and says, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home, because you are healed. The man once paralyzed is now both forgiven and healed. No spiritual and physical weight weighing him down whatsoever. He jumps up, 
Scripture tells us, picks up the mat and pushed his way through the stunned onlookers. What a feeling. What a different exit than his entry. I love a twist like that at the end. He's now, this guy is now mixing with the gathered as a bearer of the glory of Jesus' authority on his body and in his spirit. Here is how Jesus sees us, each and every one of us. Even if you're sleepy, he still sees you. He sees you right where you are, and he sees us rightly, like no one else can. All so differently abled. Like for me, can't dance. PM, can dance. (laughs) Differently abled. Still sees us rightly. Differently learned. PJ, oh, like so learned. Like me, oh, still taking classes. Differently learned, but that's okay. We're all showing up differently before him. Every single one of us. And seeing each of us just as we are, he speaks to us. And that is evidenced by scripture today. He speaks to us no matter how we've come. Take, I know that it's not the num- there's no numbers for verses here. But in verse 2, it tells us the visitors, to the visitors who have gathered to see him. Do they come with the purest of motives? Like I said, a pure, unadulterated affection towards Jesus? We don't know. It's mixed, and they're all packed like sardines in somebody else's home, but they've come to see him, and he preaches to them because that's why they've come. They wanted to hear him. Verse 5 tells us that to the four friends, he declares that he sees their faith beyond the mess they created. And in that same verse, Jesus says to the paralyzed person, he forgives the sins this man can't even speak of. And in verse 7 to 10, To the Pharisees and the religious leaders, Jesus engages their private criticism. Each are met right where they are. That's not everything. That's not all. There's something more to all this. By the gathering together of these very differently motivated and differently needy people, a miracle breaks out. There's a kind of synergy, a kind of dynamism of gathering together around Jesus, where for you, but also for me, and for him and her, but for all of us, we get a revelation of who Jesus is in our collective midst when we gather together. See how Jesus tells a paralyzed man to now get up and walk, and he does? Now, was that in response to the Pharisees? Was it for the paralyzed man? Could it have happened without the four friends still hanging out on the roof? And do not the visitors heighten the drama and the witness of all this? The answer is yes, 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 and yes. Church, we must gather together around Jesus for a revelation of him and his glory. And since we have gathered together today in Just that way, let me proclaim it. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, friends. That Jesus sees who you really are right where you are and has the authority to forgive and to heal. Christ didn't die and then find out, what? You guys were sinners? He knew about that. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not in ignorance, not as an accident, but in full knowing and seeing us right where we are. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for every bad thing, the worst thing that has been committed by us here at Echo. If you can have faith in this Christ who died with the weight of all the treacherous and despicable sins of this world on his body, 
and then rose back up again in his resurrection power, if you can hope in this Christ who now lives in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, then just open to him. Let's do that right now, just for a minute. You don't have to close your eyes, but you can. I always like to because you guys are distracting. So ask, Jesus, even right now, even here, even when I'm like this, are you for me? If you hear the answer to that often, we can start to peel off the layers that kept us from being seen and gather around Christ, costume free, and still call it a party. And after the party's over, family. You could open your eyes. Now I'm coming to a close. As PB says, landing the plane. In the season of Echo, we're inching closer to 13 years. 13 years of God's faithfulness. 13 years of so much obedience, so much yes, even when it's hard. And we're growing and maturing into the likeness of Christ. When we were young as a church, we spent a lot of time looking inward, and rightly so. As we grew, we began looking outward in service to others. And now, as we continue to mature, being contemplative and facing outward must and necessarily go hand in hand. We need to be connected to the vine, Jesus who sees us and loves us so that it is his love and his power that is flowing through us and and helping us to face outward into the world. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Without Jesus' love flowing through our wearied bodies and hearts, we're often just noisy gongs and clinging cymbals. What do they do? Attract a lot of attention without enduring welcome. When the world meets Jesus out there, perhaps because of our commitment to justice, our compassion, our courage, they'll want to come visit Jesus again in the home where he's staying. We need them to know that there is room for them here, for forgiveness, and for healing. So this week, let's enter robustly into practice of seeing. Because many of you are already doing this. God gives you a gold star, okay? But let's enter into it more robustly. The practice of seeing. Seeing. First, catch yourself being seen by God. Ask, even here, you love me? You know, not the parts that you think are shiny and flashy and God would be happy with, but the parts where you feel a little bit like, even here, you love me? Even right now, you do? Ask him. And you know, see what comes up. The noise, the thoughts, the silence. Talk to God about it. That's the first one. Second is practice seeing others through God's eyes. I really want to encourage you to email or text someone from Echo this week and let them know you see them. Cite concrete examples to share what you see in them. A decade of living with TJ Moon has helped me to really 
get a hold of how important that is. Not just this flowery language that sometimes, I mean, I like, but you know, as Christian community, we can kind of, you're so great and nice and God loves you. It's like, what? Cite some concrete example. Give me some evidence, right? <laughs> like this. Hey, I saw you making a gargantuan mess while you were doing such and such. And I saw your desire to help. I saw your courage to face hard things. Let me know if you need help next time. Not hard, right? What about, hey, I was just recalling that time when you such and such. And I just wanted to say, that speaks generosity to me. That meant so much to me during a confusing and alone time. Thanks for that. Now, some of you are more wordy. Some of you are even more concise and pithy than that. But you have freedom to email and text however way you wish to let our community know that they are seen as an individual loved by God. So can you try that? This is how our community can grow in the good news of Jesus Christ. John 13, 35 says this, right? By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. By this, if you love one another. So let's make a spacious, warm, welcoming home for Jesus and all whom he loves. A full house with Jesus at the center. Amen. I want to invite Pastor Brian up to administer communion. Let's give it up for Pastor Joanne, yeah? I'm going to take communion real quick. I'm really moved by the message. Uh, it reminds me of, of um, my time with the, uh, the ladies, <clears throat> the moms that uh, we got to meet in Mexico when I went a few weeks ago um, to meet with Practice Mercy, the ministry we're partnering with. And these, these moms who have uh, traveled some 30-some days, thousands of miles, having to have picked one out of the many children they have to, to take with them, knowing that the other kids will most likely get kidnapped back at home or taken into slavery, had to make that tough choice to pick one, at least one, right, to, to travel down from Ecuador, Honduras, or, or El Salvador, and then to meet them. And um, I'll never forget when... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I got to meet them, and the pastor, Pastor Alma, which hopefully you'll meet someday. She's, we're going to try to invite her to speak someday. Talk about a powerhouse woman of God. Uh, she surprised me because I was actually filming and trying to get some interviews for you, okay? I was trying to do this for you. I was like, oh, Echo needs to see this. And as I'm, like, trying to film, she goes, Pastor Brian, can you pray for these moms? And I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. I'm so emotional right now. And she's like, please pray for them. And so I, I grabbed one of the moms, held, the, held her hand, and Pastor Alma, she's about to translate, and I got stuck. Have you ever, like, got stuck trying to pray? Because you're like, this is so overwhelming. Like, what do you say to these people? What do you say, right? And so I... I'm reminded because Pastor Joanne's message for me, I think it can be summed up in this where I, I, I was holding her hand and I said, Lord, what do I say? And then I felt the Lord say, tell them I see them. Tell them I see them. And so um, knowing that I can't really pray long because she would have to translate, I just said, you know, there's a name in the Old Testament given by a woman in distress. And this woman says, God, you are my Elroy. You are the God who sees me. And they all started breaking in tears. 
and have, we're, all, we're all a mess. And afterwards, they come, they're giving us hugs, their kids are giving us hugs. And um, what was powerful, Joanne, was that they weren't second-guessing God's view of them. They weren't like, do you think God sees us? Do you think he sees our distress? You know what they were saying? They were grabbing me and going, God, my God sees me. I will, I will cross the border. My kids will be, my kids will be safe. We will make it to the other side, right? They had so much faith in the God who sees them. And so this is what I get from Pastor Joanne's sermon. The good news is that God sees us. God sees our doubts. He addresses them. God sees our faith and even the lack of it. The good news is that God is with us. We can come to him, surround him with our strength and our weaknesses, with our admirable faith and our weak faith. The good news is not just that God came to us, but that we can come to him. We can approach him. The good news for this paralyzed man and the friends is not just that Jesus is in town, but we can get to him if we want. Amen? And we have a God that when we come to him, he says, I see you. I don't just see your mess. I don't see your lack. I also don't see all your accolades. I see you. And I'm here for you. Let's pray. We're going to take the communion together. If you can grab your, your bread and your wine. The table of the, the bread and wine is now ready. It is a table of company with Jesus and all who love him. So come to this table. You who have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed, come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here. Let us take the body and the blood of our God who sees us. Let's take the juice, the blood that was shed for us. Let's pray. Before I give the final benediction, can you just invite the Lord? Say, Lord, come. Come this week to me. Lord, help me come to you. Right now, ask God, how do you see me? And also ask him, I want to see you this week. For others, I want you to take up Pastor Joanne's challenge. God, who do you see? Who do you want me to take notice of? The Lord's going to speak to you. Even now, he's speaking to you. He's going to give you faces and names, some people that you've never even talked to in this church he might bring up in your mind. Yeah. Lord, I love what Pastor Joanne uh, desired and prayed for us, that we would be a church known for our love, not just for the hurting world, but for our hurting uh, brothers and sisters here. God, I, I pray that Echo, as we turn 13 in a couple of weeks, that um, we will be known for that, known for um, as people who take notice, uh, who, who doesn't wait for you to come to us or find us or for friends and families here to make their way to us, but we'll be like those brothers, those friends, that take our paralyzed self and our paralyzed others to you. May we be that kind of a church. 
that by our love for each other, the world will know and you will celebrate that we are your people. May the Lord bless you. May he cause you to prosper richly this week in every good spiritual gift there is in Christ Jesus. May he watch over, guard, and protect you and all whom you love. May his countenance be upon you, his faith, face be turned toward you, such that you would see in Jesus how very much he loves you, accepts you right where you are, and invites you to follow him. May he be gracious unto you. May you sense his favor, mercy, and goodness as you walk with him this week. May the, may the Lord grant you peace. May you be at rest and centered in Jesus, who is our Lord and through whom we ask all these things. And may Christ be victorious in your life. Amen. 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 Happy Sunday, guys. Happy Halloween. We will see you next week. Love you guys.